Hey everyone, thank you so much for being here today. I'm gonna to be talking about how to use Dubsado as a system strategist, and I'm really excited to be here. So I'm Kate Potter, and this over here is Gibbs. He has a little tie on, I don't know if you can tell, but he's very excited to be here as well. He also loves Dubsado. Um, I am a system strategist and longtime lover of Dubsado. I have been obsessed with it ever since I started using it in 2018 to manage my photography business. Uh, at the time, I would literally just troll around the Dubsado Facebook community group and try to have conversations with people about it, thinking of new ways to use it, that kind of thing. This was all before um, you know, doing anything with Dubsado or other systems was even part of my business. And I just was so obsessed with the platform that I couldn't get, couldn't get enough. So before I knew it, people were sending me messages asking if I would help them set up and my business just grew from there. As of 2020, I officially quit photography to focus full time on what I love most, helping busy business owners grow their empire while putting more free time back in their lives. A little bit more about my business. In 2021, I began educating other system strategists on how to do effective and efficient Dubsado setups and other system setups. Setting up Dubsado for your own business is no joke and doing it for someone else's business requires a ridiculous amount of thought and strategy for it to be accomplished with consistent quality and in a reasonable time frame for both you and your client. Today, I've helped more than 75 businesses across more than 15 industries set up their entire business on Dubsado, and I've provided education and resources to hundreds of system strategists across the world. This has been an absolutely incredible journey, and I am just so thrilled to be here with you sharing everything that I've learned. I've even been featured. Um, I am a Dubsado certified specialist, and you'll find me in the preferred section of Dubsado's directory. And I've also been featured in Yahoo News and Finance as one of the top 10 Dubsado specialists to watch in 2021, as well as the other platforms that you see listed here. But it wasn't always like this. When I first began to offer system strategy as a serious package rather than just something I was doing on the side, it felt like projects were dragging. Communication with clients was time consuming and messy and the results I was providing were inconsistent. I was frustrated, overwhelmed, and just stuck. And I thought to myself, there has to be a better way. And from then on, I started implementing small but mighty changes in my workflows and process every single day. So that's what I want to talk with you about today. I want to tell you exactly how I've honed my workflows over the years from lead through offboarding. And although this is aimed at system strategists, there will be concepts and client experience tips that are great for any project-based business to start utilizing inside Dubsado. You'll also get details and hacks that explain actionable changes that you can implement in Dubsado in order to make your process more easy, breezy, beautiful. When you are a system strategist, especially doing Dubsado setups, it is absolutely critical that your own workflows and the rest of your process is flawless. The way that you set up your own Dubsado is a window for clients to see what they can expect. If your workflow is riddled with errors or misfires, your leads and clients may lose trust and faith in your ability to set up their system. With that in mind, my goal is for my workflow to be far more detailed and over the top than most people actually need so that I can show off every single facet of Dubsado's features and demonstrate my expertise. My workflows are set up in phases. It keeps things cleaner for me, prevents emails um, in the project based on project start dates um, or other random triggers from firing before I'm ready for them to. And it protects me against errors because even if one workflow errors for some reason, like if I customize a payment schedule and forget to update it in the, in the workflow, the rest of these steps can still run. My phases are lead, onboarding, implementation, and offboarding. So first up, we will dive into the lead phase. On my website, there are multiple ways for a client to reach out to me depending on what service they are looking for. I'm going to dive a bit deeper into one of the options than the other, but I want to make sure that I cover both. A common service offering for system strategy would be a strategy session or a systems audit. That is going to be a relatively low cost service option, usually $500 or less, but I never discourage anyone from charging higher. 
leads who are interested in these one-off services can book a time on my calendar directly from my website using the Dips Auto Scheduler. They select their time slot, give me some basic information to prepare for the work on the lead capture, and then they pay their invoice in full to officially book the slot. The second major service that I want to cover is my done for you system setup. If the lead is interested in my done for you package, then they can schedule a free discovery call. I custom quote every single done for you setup package based on the business owner's unique needs. And I find that the best way for me to get the information I need and to make sure that leads and I are a good fit for each other is through a quick 15 minute call. This is scheduled with a different depth auto scheduler and a different lead capture attached with no invoice being required to book. So just to be clear, since I have two different schedulers and two different lead captures, I use the default workflow option in the settings on my lead capture rather than using the workflow element question where the lead can select which service they're interested in and it starts a conditional workflow. For most clients that I set up, that's not the case. But for me, this is how I prefer to do it so that time can be booked directly from my website as much as possible. If a lead books a strategy session or another one-off service, then they instantly become a booked client and there's nothing else I need to do with them from a lead perspective. From here on out, I probably won't mention strategy sessions much more because my done for you workflow is a much more detailed and useful case study. Those done for you leads need some more nurturing so that we can start that relationship building process and they can be, start being primed for the sale. So the first thing that they receive from me is a confirmation of our discovery call, but I have this email customized. So it's not just this day, this time, this link. This email is infused with personality to tell them how excited I am to speak with them, to let them know what they can expect on the call, and to make sure that they just know that I can't wait to speak with them. Since I do my discovery calls on Zoom, I send them a reminder one day before the call and one hour before the call, since they have to remember to get on their computer to do something, uh, you know, as opposed to if I was giving them a call on the phone, then I could just call them at the right time and all they have to do is answer. They don't even have to remember that we have an appointment as long as they answer the phone. I really don't do anything else with my leads prior to actually talking to them on the discovery call at this point. After the discovery call, I prepare their custom quote by plugging key statistics about their business and setup into my signature pricing calculator and quote generator. I set this up a few years ago because I felt like I was just randomly quoting based on one, what I thought the client would pay, and two, how much work I thought the setup would be, although I had no real way of knowing that uh, because I wasn't measuring anything in my process. So through lots of tedious work, I started documenting how long setups took me, analyzing trends on which industries take longer, uh, which ones require more work, et cetera. Um, and then when I hired a VA, having all of this data also helped me make sure that I was pricing in a way that allowed me to stay profitable while paying someone else to do lots of the nitty gritty details. My point in all this is that I encourage you to develop a structured way that you issue quotes so that you can always justify your pricing to yourself and others. Once I've got my suggested quote and I decide what I'm going to charge, I then customize their proposal on their project. I know that a lot of people you like to use the quote like proposal method where the um, where you put the package on the invoice and then send the proposal as a confirmation of the invoice as a confirmation of the invoice, um, but that's not what I like to do. Uh, with the way I have my workflow set up, the proposal is already sitting there on the forms tab in the client's project waiting for me. So this whole process takes maybe five to 10 minutes and then I click force now on the send proposal step in my workflow to go ahead and send it. I wanna pause here to talk a bit more about that timing. I used to schedule the proposal to send 30 minutes to an hour or even a day, depending on the phase of my business after a discovery call had ended, um, so that it seemed more likely that I was personally typing this really long detailed email to every single client. Um, and I do think that that is a best practice um, in other industries uh, so that everything feels more personal. It feels like you actually typed that email out as opposed to it being really obvious that it's automated. Um, but then one day I realized that for me, these people, these leads are hiring me because I know how to make their process feel personal, even though it's automated. And they're hiring me because they want to be able to prepare and send proposals in 15 minutes or less. 
So once I had that realization, I decided that as a system strategist, it's to my benefit for me to send the email as quickly as I can, even if that gives away that my clients are receiving a template email. They know. <laughs> they know that I'm using templates and have a solid workflow because that's what they're hiring me for. On the proposal, I make sure that key information uh, that they need to make their decision is included. So not only the cost contained in the proposal itself, but also my estimated start date. I don't reserve start dates until a payment has been made. Uh, my implementation timeline, or in other words, how long it will take me to complete their project after we do their kickoff call. The goal here is that the client should have absolutely zero questions about what they would be getting in their package with me, what deliverables they'll receive, and when they can expect everything to be completed. When I send the proposal, I also send the contract and invoice at the same time. I have a very standard payment schedule. 50% is due in order to secure the booking and 50% is due prior to offboarding. So that's a TBD date in the payment plan. Here is a quick look at what that payment plan looks like. You'll notice that I have a reminder that goes uh, three days after the contract is signed. And that email reminds the lead that they are still a lead until I receive their payment. And that reminds them that they will not be able to book their onboarding meeting until they have paid that invoice. You'll see here what I was referencing earlier, that as soon as I check off that I've customized the proposal, uh, then the workflow will send it about 10 minutes after I check that off. But if needed, I do click that force now button just to make it go even faster. Debsato's after form is not completed trigger is probably one of my favorites because I think that consistently following up with leads and with quality messages to those leads is one of the biggest things that gets pushed by the wayside in the sales process. I follow up with my leads one time, just under a week after they've received the proposal, but you can definitely build in more follow-ups and that's what I love about this. With the level of investment that I'm asking for, I totally understand if it takes a bit to decide if the client is going to invest. However, I don't wanna chase leads because people that I have to chase are not my ideal client. So if they've not filled out the proposal around the one week mark, the workflow changes the project status to cold lead, and then they sit there for the rest of the year. One last little note that I want to make here is that I choose not to have my leads auto archive because I like to do analytics at the end of the year. So once a year, I go into my cold lead project status, and then I archive all of the past year leads who didn't book. If you don't think that you'll do that analysis intentionally, then I encourage you to have a cold leads auto archive in your workflow step so that you keep your dashboards and your financials clean. So that's the one little workflow step that I've added here so that you can see what that looks like. Assuming that the sales process goes my way and the lead books, then I send an immediate uh, payment confirmation, um, which you do have to set up in your workflow based on after invoice installment paid. So I've detailed what those steps look like here. I have my workflow email my social media manager via a to-do to ask her to follow my new client on social media. And then it also automatically kicks off my onboarding workflow. I wanna say a bit more about the content of the to-do for that social media manager. Uh, this is a new part of my workflow and I had to do some extra things to make it work. So first, even though I have this assigned to my social media manager, which you can see under the assigned user heading, um, I still receive a copy of that to do in my email since I am the account owner. So when I first started getting these, I was confused thinking that I needed to do it or thinking that I had assigned it to the wrong person when in fact I had done it correctly, I was just getting a copy. So I add the for social media manager to the beginning of this to do so that I know when it comes into my inbox that I can just ignore it. And in order to make this task as easy as possible for my social media manager, I include the client's information in this to do directly with smart field so that those are in the email that she receives. However, what I learned in setting this up is that the built-in Facebook and Instagram smart fields that Debsato has are not available uh, for use in to-dos. So instead, I went and made client-level custom mapped fields for Facebook and Instagram, and I remapped that on my proposal so that when clients fill in their Facebook and Instagram on the proposal, it automatically maps into this to-do. So far, this has been a great way to communicate information to my team without me having to manually intervene. When a client moves on to the onboarding stage, the first thing that happens is that I have to do some work to prepare 
to be able to onboard them. I prefer to do all of this work right up front so that then they can move through the rest of the process at their own pace. So the first thing that I need to do is create and share Google Drive folders with them so that I can collect the various assets that I need from them in order to move forward on their onboarding questionnaire. For a long time, I did this manually, but I've now upgraded and I used a paid Zap on Zapier uh, to create each folder, change the sharing permissions, and send me a message on Slack with all of those links. So as easy as it is to make Google folders, it can get time consuming. And doing all those things I mentioned, making each of these folders, changing the sharing permissions, and then copying and pasting the links is like 15 manual steps that I am saving myself by having this Zap set up. So it really, uh, adds up time and frees up my energy. Once I have the link in Slack, I go copy and paste those into my custom mapped fields that I've created within Dubsado for each of those folders. So these are project level fields. And the reason that I do this is to facilitate one of my signature hacks in Dubsado. So basically you can set up custom mapped fields to be the URL in links, in link buttons and in line links, however you want to use it in forms. So I want to be really clear that this does not work in emails. It only works when you're making links in forms. So as a system strategist, since I have a series of Google folders that I want to use in order to collect information from each client, this is a much easier way for me to add all five of those links to their project and have them show up in the correct places within their onboarding form. It makes it way faster for me to get to that stage in the process. I don't want to spend too much more time explaining this whole process since this webinar is about how to use Dubsado. <laughs> However, I did just write a blog on this topic, so make sure that you check it out and you can also get my zap recipe for the folder creation on that blog. Once those links are added, it's time to start sending my clients their onboarding next steps. So first, the workflow applies the onboarding questionnaire to their portal only. So that send form step that you see there is only putting it in the portal. There's no communication going to the client with that step. The first communication that I have with the client is to send a scheduler for them to book their kickoff onboarding process mapping session, whatever you want to call it. And now I'm sure you're like, wait, Kate, you just spent all those time setting up those folder links to go into the onboarding questionnaire and you just applied it to the portal. Why aren't you sending that to them right now? So the answer is that I really believe in only giving clients one assignment at a time. It just makes them feel so much more clear about the entire process and it keeps things from getting too overwhelming. I send the kickoff meeting scheduler before the onboarding questionnaire because then the date of the kickoff meeting becomes the due date for their onboarding questionnaire. Some may prefer to do the opposite, uh, send the questionnaire, and then once it's complete, allow them to schedule their onboarding meeting. Doing it that way just ensures that you have the information that you need before they book time on your calendar. Uh, but in my opinion, that way of doing things just drags out the project, makes it take longer, and I'm all about keeping the project moving as quickly as possible for a better experience for both you and for your client. So once the client has scheduled their onboarding meeting, then I send the client portal guide and I direct them to go to the portal to fill out their onboarding questionnaire, which the workflow applied to the portal in the previous step. In case you're not familiar, the client portal guide is actually a free template that Dubsado offers in the template library. I've personally customized it for my own business and I always give my clients their own branded copy of a client portal guide as an extra bonus. If I'm being honest about my process, I, I don't really need the client portal. Um, but since clients are coming to me to use Dubsado in their own business, it helps the client understand the experience of getting into the portal and allows them to make a more informed decision about whether they want to use that feature for their clients. And I think that this extends to any other kind of system that you're setting up, whether that's a project management tool, an email marketing tool, whatever it is, they should be experiencing the interaction from the client side in your process. Anyway, at the same time that I'm sending them access to the client portal and their client portal guide, I'm also telling them that their next bit of homework is to complete their onboarding questionnaire, which is found in their portal. This is giving them a reason to log into the client portal because otherwise they probably just wouldn't. 
So that further enhances their experience and helps keep it clear what their next steps are, log into the portal, complete the homework. One of the things that I have learned in my own time in business and that I've begun to implement as a best practice in all of my system builds is that anytime you send a questionnaire, you should be sending follow-up reminders if it's not completed at key points in the process, and you should be sending completion confirmations. This is a bit of a unique circumstance though, because for me, their process mapping session could be next week or it could be three months from now, and that's when their onboarding questionnaire is due. So it doesn't really make sense to follow up about the onboarding questionnaire within a set number of days because they may still have months to get this done. So since it's less concrete than usual, I'm actually taking care of the onboarding questionnaire reminder in a scheduler reminder email. This is, this is kind of a different use case. This is a little bit different. Um, most people are not going to set it up this way, but if you are doing a project based business, you know, if it's based on these milestones, then this might be something helpful for you. So I have a reminder set in my scheduler to go three days before the process mapping session. So you can see that over on the left, the 72 hours, how's your onboarding questionnaire going email. Um, that email is asking them how it's going and it directs them back to their portal to complete the onboarding questionnaire with the portal link smart field and the portal password. And that's a really important note because you can't send an actual form link smart field in a scheduler reminder email. So sending them to the portal is the workaround for that. And they should already be familiar with getting into the portal since that's how we originally introduced the onboarding questionnaire to them. I also have a step in the workflow for two days before the onboarding meeting to have my VA check to make sure that the onboarding questionnaire is complete. That way, if it's not, she can alert me and I can follow up manually as needed. So again, I start that to do with for VA. And just to be clear, all of these are actually for their names, um, but for anonymity, I am just calling them their title in this presentation. So again, um, I start the to-do with 4VA so that when I receive the notification in my inbox, it's clear that I don't personally need to do anything. My VA received it. And then, of course, once they complete the form, they receive a completion alert through the workflow. As usual, every single questionnaire should have something like that. So then it's process mapping session time, um, which is how I officially kick off and get started on the project. At the start of the process mapping session, the onboarding workflow automatically starts the next phase workflow, which I call the implementation workflow. Others might call this stage fulfillment or something of that nature, but I call it implementation. So before moving on to that implementation phase, I do also want to mention that I also have a to-do email reminder for myself in the onboarding workflow to let me know when it has been three and a half weeks since the process mapping session, because at that point it's crunch time and it's time to finish. So if I've fallen behind, then this to-do makes sure that I'm never late. Now, this is also predicated on the idea that I have a very structured way of handling system build out so that I know that no matter what, no matter if I'm sick, no matter if I lose my VA, no matter what life throws at me, I can finish a system setup in four weeks or less. Although this isn't actually an onboarding activity, it's in the onboarding workflow because it's based on the process mapping session. So it has to be in that workflow since this is where I send that scheduler. Phase three is implementation. You might also hear this referred to as book, fulfillment, any other number of names, but implementation is my name for it. And I also think that this workflow is one of the more unique ways that I used Absato that far more businesses with you know, project-based um, services could use Absato. So after the process mapping session, I send a second questionnaire. This is called the implementation questionnaire. So this questionnaire is separate from the onboarding questionnaire because until I know the process, there is no way for me to accurately gather certain details. I could ask for some of this before the process mapping session and some of it might stick, but some of it would change or not be relevant or there would be things missing. And then it's harder to figure out what the difference is between what's already been submitted and what needs to be submitted now. I think it's easier to customize this questionnaire once I actually know what I need from the client related to their process. The implementation questionnaire asks for details about forms, schedulers, emails, and other outside assets that I identified as we mapped through their process together on the process mapping session. 
So again, I practice what I preach. I currently have four reminders for the implementation questionnaire set up. I email them two days before it's due to ask them to prioritize it over the next two days to make sure it's done by the due date. I email them on the due date to say, hey, this is due today. Am I going to see it? And then I also have email reminders set up for two days overdue and three days overdue. Now that may seem random. <laughs> why two days? Why three days? You know, why no more than that? You know, what's going on here? So here's the truth. I don't typically have people turning things in late. So usually the only email that they're receiving are the first one reminding them that the due date's coming up and the one on the actual due date. The other ones are emails that I added to my workflow after I had to manually remind a client who was late on their implementation questionnaire. So it was more of an exception than the rule. So I wrote the email um, and wrote it manually, sent it, and then I immediately added it to my workflow so that I wouldn't have to do that again. So if I find myself in the future needing to send more reminder emails, then I will add those to my workflow as well. So in the future, this may be very built out. I guess the other thing that I should note here as well is that I do also have it built into my contract that if they are too late, um, you know, if they are going to be, if they are late enough that I'm not going to be able to meet our originally scheduled deadline, then I'm pausing their project and considering it inactive and they would have to pay a fee to restart if it hits the point of being abandoned. So make sure that you have lots of protections built into your contract for yourself so that if you can't meet a deadline because of a client not following on their responsibilities, um, that you're protected. And then of course, I email them when their implementation questionnaire is complete to reassure, to reassure them that I've received it and to let them know I'll reach out if I have any more questions and to let them know what happens next. When you're a system strategist, especially if you're doing Dubsado setups, there are too many nitty gritty steps to manage all of this in Dubsado via to-dos. So you need a project management system to keep up with what you've done to date and what else still needs to be done, especially if you're running multiple client projects at one time. It takes a while to learn the formula, but all the system setup steps are fairly formulaic. For Dubs Auto Setups, I know every single thing I need to do and the order that I need to do it in in order to move the project along in the most quick and efficient manner. So I know that if you're watching this, you probably already know that. But the reason that I wanted to say all of this is to set the context for the next steps in my workflow that I'm going to show you on the next slide for why I have those workflow setups, those workflow steps set up the way I do and how I'm able to have them like that. This is a solution that could be implemented in so many businesses that are based on project milestones rather than being based strictly on specific dates and workflow actions. So here's what I've done. In my project management system, I've split all of the work that I need to do into three phases. And I always do the same tasks in each of those three phases. And here's why. What that allows me to do is set up this workflow with a series of three to do's followed by three actions. I keep all client communication in email. I know lots of other system strategists add clients to a project management tool or to Slack or to Voxer or something like that, but I choose not to because I think it's easiest to keep all communication in one location that clients are already familiar with. If a client is coming to you to ask for help with setting up a system, they're probably not tech savvy and they won't be interested in learning another new tool to communicate with you. So when I complete phase one in my project management tool, as referenced on the last slide, I check off that phase one is done in my workflow, which then triggers an email to go that says, hey, client, I have finished A, B, C, and D. Next up, I'm working on E, F, G, and H. So please make sure that you've completed your implementation questionnaire. The same thing happens when I check off that I've completed phase two. An email goes to the client that, that says, hey, I'm done with IJK LMNOP. Um, and next up, I'm working on QRSTUV. And then after that, it'll be time for offboarding. So I'm always telling the client where I've been and where I'm going next in every single email. <laughs> And so that detail about what I have finished, it really makes clients feel secure about the deliverables that have been accomplished so far. And it reassures them that the project is on track and they're getting everything they thought they were getting. Making sure that clients are aware of your progress is critical to a good client experience, no matter what you do. 
So finally, when I finish phase three, rather than sending an email directly in this workflow, it actually starts my offboarding workflow. And that offboarding workflow sends an email letting them know that I'm done. And I'm going to dive into that here in just a sec. So if you have stuck with me this long, thank you. Um, I am so excited to talk about offboarding now. I know that there has already been a ton of information here, but offboarding is such a key part of the process that I think can get overlooked. And so I've done my best to build out this part of my client experience just as much as every other part so that my clients leave feeling happy with their results and empowered to take over their own system and run their business, business with it. So here we go. Once I mark that phase three is complete, AKA the entire project is complete, uh, that's when my off, that's when I send my offboarding scheduler. So this email says something along the lines of, yay, your project is complete. I ask them to pay their invoice uh, and I include the invoice link with the invoice smart field. And then I say, once you've paid, please book your offboarding call. I haven't had much trouble with people not paying their invoice before booking their appointment. So I've been able to maintain this nice combined email structure. But if you find that you have to chase clients for payment, then I would probably wait to send the scheduler until you've gotten their final payment. So that would then be send invoice and then send appointment scheduler after invoice has been paid in full. All payment should be collected prior to offboarding because at that point you've done all the work and they already have all the deliverables in their possession. Leading up to offboarding, there isn't much communication that I do with the client. At offboarding, I walk the, the client through every single step of each workflow I've created for them. I literally go to templates, workflow, and then click the gear icon and open up every single step so that you, they can see all of the details. This allows the client to make small changes along the way, verify that it matches the experience that we map together in onboarding, and then it serves as a final check for me to make sure that I plugged everything in correctly. The client is probably not going to notice if I make a mistake, but I will, and I can fix it right there on the call, and then I know that there are no errors in their workflow. After the offboarding call, I manually send the client several resources. So this is one of the few points in my workflow. I think this will be the first one to date where the workflow step is not sending the email for me after I check off a to do. And instead, I am actually manually sending this email. The reason that it's manual is because I need to attach so many assets to it that I pull from the forms tab. And so I always send this email the same day as offboarding so that follow-up support always begins the same day as offboarding. This is really important for my workflow timing to be correct, which I'll show you here in just a moment. Um, but the resources that I am manually attaching here include the recording of the call, which I put on the forms tab as a one-time link, their original flowcharts from our process mapping session, which I upload to the forms tab as a PDF. It includes their next steps guide, which is a Dubsado questionnaire that I've designed that tells them exactly how they should be using their follow-up support period in order to make sure that they understand their own system. Plus, I can use that to hand off key assets like their customized Canva designs. And then finally, I include the login information to a training hub where I have videos with little how-tos that are specific to the way that I like to do system setups. And so that is an in-email link that doesn't change. And my people are added to that training hub via a zap. So the idea with all of this is that I'm giving my clients everything they need to succeed, but it will not work if they don't put in their own time and energy. I can do a setup all day. I could do setups every day, um, but clients are ultimately the ones running their business on the setup. So they have to understand how it works. So my workflow sends them some check-in emails throughout the 30-day support period to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing as outlined on the next steps guide. I literally tell them exactly what to do and I remind them to do it. So as long as they do it, by the end of this 30 days, they should feel absolutely amazing and they should completely understand how to work their system. It all culminates in an email that officially notifies them that support has ended, that our project together has ended. This is extremely important for setting client boundaries so that your clients understand that if they need support in the future, they need to engage with you in a paid offering type way. 
So I send them to a link um, on a, a page, a hidden page on my website um, where I have all of the services available just for my past clients. So what you see here, this uh oh hotline help, Q&A strategy session, VIP half day update, these are only available to past clients. Um, and then I do also offer them the chance to extend their follow up support if they would like. And I do that by sending them an additional proposal and they do have to pay for that all up front. So I try to just provide a variety of ways that they can re-engage with me depending on the size of their need. The goal is to keep my options and offers simple while also making it easy for the, for the client to book. And this helps me avoid fielding never ending email support um, because I can very tactfully refer people here if they need more help. Like I have said several times throughout this presentation, I think this is something that is so important for all project-based businesses, whether you are a web designer, whether you are somebody who does uh, email marketing setups, whether you do project management system setups, whatever you do, once your work with a client is over, you need a, a very official handoff email that says our work is done. It's really key for their clarity and for your protection. And then once follow-up support is over and it's all said and done, I send them an offer to ask them to join my affiliate program. So Dubsado has actually done a previous ho user-hosted webinar um, in the past on how to use Dubsado to manage your affiliate or referral program. Um, so make sure that you check that out. It was done by Crystal Clark. It was really well done. Um, and I think that it would just really help you get your entire system set up for that. As you can see, it's 43 minutes long and I don't want to spend another 43 minutes of your time today. So um, make sure that you check out that other webinar that's available um, from Dubsado on YouTube. So thank you so much for your time today. I hope that you found this to be a valuable presentation that has given you some ideas for how you can really enhance your own client experience using Dubsado, especially as a system strategist. If you haven't yet signed up for Dubsado, you can use my code XOKATE to get 30% off on your first bill. That's $120 savings on an annual subscription, so it's definitely worth it. I also have a Facebook group for system strategists and a separate Facebook group for other business owners who want to use systems to up, to, who want to use systems to up level their businesses. Um, I have an entire freebie library called the Boss Bank. I offer strategy sessions and I offer system strategist mentoring. I have a whole shop full of helpful resources for you on my website. So make sure that you check out katepotter.com. And I hope that you get in touch with me. Um, you can follow me on social media at Kate Potter Consulting on both Facebook and Instagram. Um, and you can join my email list also from katepotter.com. So um, I really would love to hear um, what you thought about this, what was most helpful, and um, what resources might be able to help you in the future. So thank you so much for your time today and happy automating.